Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and let's get started today. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Deborah Hughes, Assistant Director of the Publicity and Publications at DAS, and I'll be your host along with Head of DAS International, Annaberta Oles Jayan. Uh, thank you for attending today's webinar, where our specialist teacher, Shilpa, will be sharing on the topic of higher order comprehension strategies and skills for students with dyslexia or language difficulties. Now, we've been using Zoom for a long time now, so I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, and uh, we were hoping to live stream today, but we've had a glitch. So we'll have to upload this video later onto our YouTube channel and we'll share it on Facebook as well. So those who aren't able to join us, we will still hope to get the video to you. If you have any questions for us, just please click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. You know the rules, just put a question in there or you can use chat. Um, and we will hope to gather all the questions and answer them at the end of Shilpa's presentation. And of course, if we don't get around to answering all the questions, I'm sure Shilpa will uh, do some write-ups for us and we'll post them on the DAS International website. So let's get started. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce you to our wonderful presenter today, uh, Shilpa Madani. Uh, Shilpa started her teaching career as a preschool teacher for five years and then decided to equip herself with the necessary skills to help children with learning difficulties. Uh, she trained with the Orton Gillingham approach and she obtained a dyslexia diploma and became and came to work for DAS International in 2013. Shilpa aims to understand the strengths, weaknesses and learning styles of children with learning differences so that she can design individualized programs to help them and motivate them to achieve in their learning targets. She believes that it is important to build a strong rapport with students and create a conducive learning environment for the smooth delivery of knowledge. And also today with us, we have Mrs. Miss Annabert, Ms. Sorry, Annaberta Oles Jane, the head of DAS International. Anna has a wealth of experience in providing support for students with learning differences. And as a head of DAS International, she aims to provide a professional service to the SPLD community, both in Singapore and in the region. Hello, Anna, over to you. Hi, thank you, Deborah. Hi. Thank you. And uh, a warm welcome to all of everyone here that's joined us. Nice big group uh, we have, uh, parents, teachers, Ally educators, yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us today during your lunch hour. I'm your host, as Deborah mentioned, Annaberta, head of DAS International. And along with my co host, Deborah, thank you, uh, our head of publicity and our senior specialist teacher, um, Ms. Shilpa, we bring you the DAS International uh, Spotlight on Specialist Teachers uh, webinar today. And what a better way, I thought, you know, uh, to start. Uh, we started on Saturday with a wonderful walk uh, at Gardens by the Bay to, to, to raise funds for our dyslexic students. And this whole month we'll be, uh, you know, looking at activities. So this week, um, I thought to start the World Dyslexia Awareness Month. Uh, it's to share, to invite and to hear directly from um, one of our senior specialist teachers, Shilpa. And she'll be sharing with us on the topic which we've, we thought about and thought, okay, this will be of high interest uh, to educators and parents. Uh, higher order comprehension strategies and skills for students with dyslexia, having dyslexia or language difficulties. So students with uh, specific learning differences such as dyslexia, ADHD, dysgraphia, who are already struggling with reading fluency or spelling may then face um, a hurdle when approaching a comprehension passage and analyzing it. This is a huge challenge for a lot of our kids. So Shilpa today will share on how this process perhaps could be made more interesting for the child and easier for a learner who learns differently. And of course, then easier for, for everyone here to support the child. So without further ado, I will share the screen. I am officially the screen sharer <laughs> and uh, supporting Shilpa here. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, over thank to you, you Shilpa. Thank, yes. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deb. Thank and thanks, Anna. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Shilpa, and uh, I think I won't uh, 
uh, introduce myself anymore. Both of them have done a great job introducing me. So he, today we will be speaking about uh, higher order comprehension, what strategies and skills for students with dyslexia and language difficulties, we can try these strategies. Uh, so Anna, can we start the slideshow please? Yeah. Yes. I just need to move this. It's being blocked, sorry. Okay, thanks. Okay, so what is comprehension? So it's such a commonly used word and it's such a common uh, definition we all know. Like when we say, okay, comprehension means whatever you're reading or whatever somebody is telling you, you comprehend, you understand. So it's such a simple uh, definition, but uh, there is a little more technical definition which actually describes uh, details. And I really like this, you know, which, which says comprehension is a complex cognitive process involving the intentional interaction between reader and text to extract meaning. Very well uh, said this is, because there is an interaction going on between the reader and the text when we are reading something. It's not that we are just running our eyes over those letters. There is some kind of uh, interaction is happening, something we are understanding. So it all kind of comes out with a different product at the end of it. So this word is originated from Latin term, okay, let me pronounce it correctly, comprehensionem which means seizing. Again, very aptly used word, seize. You seize or grasp the information or the topic which is reflected in a passage or story or whatever. And then what happens is this seized information is then incorporated into our own knowledge. Now, what's our own knowledge, which, which is pre-existing, which we all have kind of uh, collected and retained and you know stored in our brain over the period of years or whatever our life. And uh, so this uh, seizing process is converted into uh, incorporating. Anna, next slide, please. Yeah, so this looks like uh, addition equation. I always feel that comprehension is a bit like math. Uh, so because there, there is something direct uh, working, direct answers, there is a lot of logic sometimes we need, which we need in math as well. So here is this, I put it up uh, in, a, in an equation form seizing, which is mental grasping of an idea or a topic which you are reading. When the child is reading something, it's important that they are grasping at least part of it, if not all. Then it's gone, it's already incorporated in our brain. It's incorporated in our information, which is already there. So I'm sure every child, uh, just like an adult, every child also has certain storage of information. So what happens in this process, again, same thing, mental grasping plus incorporating the information equals to comprehension. So that's the end product and the real true comprehension, which is the total understanding of what they are reading. Yeah, next, Anna. Thank you. Okay, so it's all easy to say like, okay, comprehension, you know, we read, the children read and understand and we talk to them with, as long as there is no learning issue or uh, there is no dyslexia present, or no language-based uh, uh, problem, like you know, learning disability. So it's all easy for us. But when there is something like dyslexia, dysgraphia, or ADHD, what all we need for these comprehension skills? What, what are the good, what is required for these good comprehension skills? So children need to be able to decode what they read, basically reading that word correctly, understanding what they are reading, make connections with their prior knowledge, able to connect what they're reading to what they know, which we just now uh, saw in our definition. Think deeper about the text they read. So I remember saying this to one of my students, you know, when I was teaching, I said, so I didn't want to say think deeper. So, you know, I, I just use the word, you know what, we need to read between the lines. So there was a bit of silence for about a minute. And then he stared at me, he looked at me and he said, but there is nothing between these two lines. What is it that you want me to read? It was, it was a wake-up call to me that no, I can't use something like this, you know, reading between the lines. It's all easy to say. So then I just didn't, I didn't want to elaborate it. I said, okay, what I mean is we are going to talk about it more. Let me see what you know. Let, let me share with you what I know. And then we go beyond what this passage is trying to tell. So thinking deeper, making connections, and of course, decoding, it's the it's like, you know, it's the base foundation of everything, which most of the uh, students with dyslexia, they uh, face this struggle, the decoding. 
and we have to work on that, the phonological awareness, how they can blend, how they can read. So these are the basic things which I need is required for good comprehension, to develop a good comprehension skill. So next slide, Anna. Okay. So factors impacting reading comprehension skills of learners who have dyslexia or any language-based difficulty. Poor accuracy in uh, decoding, just now which I mentioned, they need to look at that word. Sometimes uh, if uh, the dyslexia is at, I mean, it's not, if they are borderline dyslexic, usually it, the process goes a little quicker. But if they are struggling with decoding, so mix the sounds, the letter sound coordination, then reading the word, then making the meaning, you know, the thinking of the meaning. So that affects the reading speed, obviously, because word to word, if they are going. So uh, I think as therapists, as teachers, what we all always try to do is we try to develop a whole word approach. We don't make them dependent on blending all the time because that definitely impedes their uh, reading speed. So poor accuracy will affect reading speed. It will automatically become poor. So in so much effort is gone in accuracy, in reading, that the retention of sequence of events in that comprehension passage of in any story for that matter, it's difficult to retain, right? It's, it doesn't happen, it lacks because by the time they read everything, they go forward, uh, what happened on the previous pages is probably lost. So that affects their memory, the retention of facts. And uh, if, there are, there are certain conditions like comorbidity. It's not only dyslexia. Usually dyslexia comes with, uh, you know, connect with something. It's like a package. So there could be attention deficit disorder. If that is there, so I have observed, or rather many of us have observed, that sometimes uh, a child with uh, attention deficit is good with reading, at reading fluency. They even have good uh, reading understanding, like good comprehension skill. But because of distraction because of very short attention span, they tend to forget the facts which they read, although they understand. So we need to work, like we need to break it into chunks and we have to make them focus, try to work on their attention span most of the time. So it's, a, it's quite a bit of struggle for them, you know. But again, I don't like to call comprehension activity as a task. It's not a task. I always say, let's do comprehension because it's more like a story what we are reading. So we have to create that interest. So we have to uh, get that child to think that, okay, I'm going to read something which is either you're going to give me some information or it's some story you can discuss. Uh, instead of only focusing that how slow the child is going, we use some strategies to get them to uh, read slow, you know, a paragraph by paragraph. So make it easier, break it and make it easier. Now what happens, the fourth here, fifth point is poor or limited vocabulary. Obviously, this can happen when there is poor decoding because the effort is so much that uh, the willingness to learn more words automatically takes a backseat. Another reason could be uh, sometimes the background, the back, they come from different backgrounds. They're not exposed to, you know, how to say, uh, uh, they, they come from a different language background. So they're not exposed to many like vast vocabulary of English, what they hear, always right we always say what children hear they store and they learn that process is continuous so that could also create a, a hurdle uh, in expanding their vocabulary so that's where the teacher's work begins we have to really make an effort to create you know you make word banks uh, you introduce them to new words if there are any words in the passage which they, you can see you can straight away see that the child is uh, struggling or doesn't know, you focus on them, uh, give them multiple meanings, synonyms, antonyms, make it like a, a full-fledged activity and make them enjoy actually. Like, uh, we, basically what I personally feel is it should become like a full-fledged activity. It should never be like read the comprehension passage, go to questions, write the answers. No, it is understanding as much as possible and enjoying it. So limit, poor or limited vocabulary can be overcome slowly by introducing new words. And uh, like I said, word bank, using those words every session, uh, using certain words to make uh, into sentences, using them into sentences 
reinforces the you know meaning part of it. So next time you ask, so they make an effort. They try to remember it and they say, yes, I did it last time. I remember this word I've used and I've seen this happening and I think the child feels very positive about it. Now here, <laughs> last but not the least, difficulty finding answers to questions, especially inferential. So there are different types of questions. I'll be going to that slide later. You know, there are direct questions, there are referent questions. Inferential questions are the most challenging ones, where the, the thing which I said, reading between the lines or thinking beyond words, or, you know, so usually those uh, questions are like that. Why do you think this is happening? So the student is expected to think the answer is in the passage, but they have to paraphrase it. They have to phrase in their own words. They, now, children with uh, dyslexia, they have this cognitive inflexibility, you know, which impacts when some certain kind of questions they face. They don't want something uh, which is out of ordinary. The reaction is, oh, I don't know, but I don't know what to write. Where is it? It's not in the passage. So that's the immediate reaction to some of the inferential uh, questions. So the reason is the cognitive inflexibility. We have observed it in most of the students because they feel safe when something is straightforward, it's right in front of them. Yes, good to write. But then that's not going to be the case, right? It's never going to be the case when they go in exam or when they're doing various activities, they have to face uh, more challenging questions. So we have to, discuss we have to give them uh, how what we can do is you know the teacher can ask them to look at the sentence previous to that there is some hint so you can give them the hint look at this paragraph what does it say why do you think it says if you were in that situation what you would do it can be a very multi-pronged effect multi-pronged effort which gets the child to st start thinking basically so the fear also goes away that you know oh okay in a story, if I was put in this situation, or if a child is animal lover, you talk about animals, you make more uh, informative uh, you know, uh, discussion. So interactive discussion is what the children are ready to participate, most of them, most of them. Uh, we have faced, uh, we have also had children with selective mutism who don't like to talk, but no harm. We can, I, I remember I used to write everything on the board, what I wanted to discuss because uh, the student didn't want to uh, volunteer, didn't want to speak, but there was so much in her mind. I knew that she had so much thinking going on. So we don't give up. We uh, kind of, you know, give them the hints and then slowly, slowly the inferential answers will come. Basically what happens here is they find it difficult to reorganize the text uh, information to meet or suit the demand of the changing questions. So the minute something different comes, they don't want to reorganize the information which is given in the text. We show them the ways which can be done. You can show the organizer, uh, you can draw pictures, connect them to uh, that information. Another thing we, uh, we need to work on is uh, which they find difficult. The meaning, contextual meaning of a phrase or a word or sometimes idiomatic uh, meaning, that's what we say. They, they take literal meaning to that, you know, and then they say, but there is no ball. Suppose it said, the ball is, was in her court now. So the children get stuck, but where is the ball? The Mishilpa, there is nothing in the passage about ball or about a game. So that's where you stop, you explain, you use it and you make them use it. And you know, I, it definitely works. And uh, how to say, reinforce it using it get them to use it in sentences in their stories so basically these are the things we can always try doing them not to discourage them we have to try to encourage them make them feel confident uh, anna can we go to the next slide okay. now here comes the importance of various types of vocabulary in comprehension we just hope that vocabulary is um, developed as the child grows up what kind of exposure child has uh, in Singapore, we are like, our children are lucky that they're exposed to so much of English language in school. But uh, we have uh, uh, seen some kids who have moved from other countries, children who have to move countries, you know, like we call them third culture kids. So they are already, they have uh, learned some other in some other language medium and they have to come and they have to face English uh, language complete 
studying in English language. So that's where the various types of vocabulary. I think various types of vocabulary in comprehension is extremely important. Two types here, which I have mentioned, receptive, which is input, and expressive is output. So receptive is words that a person can comprehend, respond to, or basically we hear, we see, we speak, uh, communication is happening. And, uh, you know, it's all there, like that. But when it comes to expressing, so with the expression or putting it on the paper, that's where uh, the challenge begins for children with a language difficulty. Spoken language is good. Listening to teacher is good. The interactive discussion also helps. But when it starts, when they have to write it in certain way or uh, they have to use expressions, that's where they sometimes struggle. So there, it has been, there has been a research that receptive vocabulary is typically larger than expressive vocabulary, uh, vocabulary, which we all know and we agree because receptive happens all the time. Expressive, they have to make an effort to uh, put on the paper or express. The next uh, slide, Anna. Thank you. So uh, here are the, I, I'm going to discuss two types of comprehension tasks. Again, let me take out the word. Actually, I shouldn't have put task, comprehension activities. Two types, visual text and open-ended. So visual text is usually given in the format of, a, of an advertisement or a flyer or a poster with lots of pictures and text. All, it's a combination. And there is a lot of information, but you have to connect it to the pictures. Sometimes you have to derive some information from the pictures. And then the questions asked are multiple choice. So which is okay. They just have to circle the uh, letter of the answer or they have to choose one. This looks easy, but this becomes more like a math problem. They either get it right or wrong. So they have to be very careful uh, when they are choosing MCQ in visual text. So they have to really observe. Second type of comprehension task or activity which our children have to do is open-ended, which is again very commonly, it is for all the ages, like it starts in grade one all the way to IB level or IGCSE level. So open-ended is long passage with text, open-ended questions, literal, refer referent, inferential, vocabulary questions, or evaluative. So these are all different types of questions are phrased. Of course, the child doesn't have to write the name of the question there, but they have to understand that this is how they have to answer that question. So we as teachers have to explain to them. So student is expected to write full sentences. Another student of mine, I still can't forget him. This was almost 10 years ago. He was a PSLE student. I think he was already exhausted by studying. Uh, he was in... DAI International, say this uh, specialist tutoring I was doing. And then one day when we did the comprehension activity, he finished it so fast. It was so quick and I was impressed. I mean, there was already improvement in his reading fluency and comprehension. Yes, I could see that. And I said, oh, really? You finished all the answers so quick. And when I <laughs> took a to the answer sheet, to it was quite interesting. He had written under every question, Refer to paragraph two. Refer to paragraph one. Mishilpa referred to paragraph three. I said, I asked him, what, what is this? So he said, look, you want to know the answers, right? The questions you have asked, you want to know the answers. So I'm just telling you, you can refer it. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I, I admired that, you know, he will make a good leader later on. I'm sure he won't waste time in small smaller things in life, but... I, I told him, I said, my dear, I don't need to know the answers. You need to know the answers and you need to show that you know the answers. He said, oh, okay. So actually I had to walk out of the classroom to uh, uh, have a good laugh. And then I walked in and then we did the whole activity all over again. So the best thing is like kids can think like that. Sometimes they're so exhausted that they will just find their own way. You know, They don't want to write the whole sentences. This is an effort. This can be an effort for a child who has uh, severe dyslexia or any language-based, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, difficulty or uh, ADHD because they lose attention. By the time they have written half the answer, sometimes they just don't want to complete it or they have forgotten what they want to write. So this is where, again, we 
go and use some strategies. Uh, Anna, can we go to the next uh, slide? Thank you. This is an example of visual text comprehension. It's a nice poster about uh, some kind of race and the, fl the fluids, the liquids which you can take. Some, some company, Vita Plus, has tried this. And there, there is a picture. There are two pictures only. Sometimes there are more, but it is nicely given in tabulated form. There's a lot of information. So children are expected to look at everything carefully. How one can go about it? We can go to next uh, slide. Uh, let, let our, uh, you, do, uh, Anna, do you think let our view, uh, attendees take a look at that poster? Or shall I just move here? Yeah, just let, just, yeah. Shall we? Thank you. So now how to approach a visual text comprehension? I have broken it into five parts. Everybody can, of course, every teacher can do their own uh, strategy, definitely. But this is what generally we use with our students who have dyslexia and you know who are kind of struggling with every single, there's too much information sometimes on that poster. So how do we go about it? What I do is, I get them to read the entire visual text at least twice to the last word. So it's a kind of challenge actually. And there is there's a joke going on. So sometimes they ask me, will you read? Have you read, uh, read it? So I tell them, yes, yes, I read it too. And then they catch me that, okay, you missed out this. I let them do that. I think that role of reversal is actually very useful at times. But we have to make them aware that they cannot exclude anything. Look at the picture carefully. Talk about the picture, even though it is a small picture, whatever, one, two pictures, discuss. We discuss with them, like, you know, okay, what do you see in the picture? What is this, this child doing? What, what do you think the title means? That's where the annotation begins. They can use colored pencils, pens, highlighters. If some, some children, I have noticed that if they highlight too much, they themselves start getting confused. So I uh, encourage them to underline or just circle with, you know, color pencil. Because I, I noticed it with uh, some of my students, they would highlight and they would be so confused at the end of it that they wouldn't know why, why did they highlight it? So we decided, no, we are not going to do that. So single line of a pencil, which is useful. So that doesn't confuse a dyslexic child more. Annotate the structure and features of the given poster. Here, I even speak about how the uh, poster is made. Literally, we speak about, you know, look at the size of the poster, look at the shape how they have put it in that right hand corner why they put it this in the at the bottom why do you think the title is written in the big bold letters every small thing i know during exam they don't have time to do that but this is what we are doing we are developing their skill visual skill and this is happening the process is happening the visual skill and everything is now uh, converted into the information and it is retained in their mind you know in their brain so we can spend time on that. So annotation is very important. Tagline, title, metrics, images, body text, and identify the purpose and use. So now here, like outdo yourself. So uh, when I was doing this comprehension, so uh, one kid asked me, well, why should I outdo myself? What do they mean by that? So then we had a big discussion that, you know what, instead of feeling, sometimes we don't perform well, but we can always aim to do better. Not only in sports, we always keep aim to do a little better than what we did last time in our academics, in our work, in our comprehension activity. And yes, totally agreed. He totally agreed with me. So we can kind of, what I'm trying to say here is we can connect what is given in, uh, in a poster, we can also connect with our everyday things and we can talk about it. Highlight, just now I said highlight key facts or underline actually. Then key themes, key contact details. This comes when there is that advertise, you know, they give them the poster about, uh, about an event. So event takes place here, Can contact this person, email here, this is the promotion. If you sign up before this date, oh, there's a lot to absorb actually. It's even as an adult, sometimes when I look at these posters, I feel, oh, wow, there is so much. And then we don't want to lose the promotion. So we, I always discuss with them that, okay, you know, something if we are going to get free, let's not 
lose it. So how do you look at it? Underline those things. So highlighting or underline, eliminate. When does the elimination start? Uh, they move to their uh, questions, read the options carefully, use elimination technique by checking each option against the given text. So go, go there, check, does it say similar? Because it can be very tricky. Some questions in uh, visual text come, come across as quite tricky, you know. They can trick the student. So you teach them that slowly, carefully look at that. Uh, then cancel out the option which doesn't match. And then finally choose the correct answer or number option and recheck before moving forward. It is better to recheck every question instead of finishing all six or whatever five they've asked. Because by the time that child has done, a child with uh, learning difficulty, if he finishes the whole six questions and then he wants to go back and check sometimes, sometimes it becomes a bit challenging for them because they have to again go and look at what they wrote. So it is better to ask them to recheck before moving to second, uh, uh, whatever sub question is there. Anna, can we move to the next one, please? Okay. So this is uh, where the strategies for making an open-ended uh, reading comprehension easier, more interesting for a child who has specific learning uh, difficulty. Yeah. So there are, uh, I have put here eight uh, kind of points. So we can look at prior knowledge, prediction, visualization, identifying main theme or idea, numbering the paragraphs, uh, summarizing each paragraph, highlighting keywords in each paragraph and understand the meaning, direct as well as contextual, making uh, inference. Okay, I should have read it. Actually, I should have gone it this way. I think what I would do when I was making the slide, it, it came up like that because I was using those uh, icons. Numbering the paragraph should be the first activity because that's what we tell the child. And I always make a statement, you know, I know it's a bit of a, I mean, uh, I myself find it funny when I say that. I'll say, oh, thank God, there are only four paragraphs. Thank God, there are no six paragraphs. That itself puts the child to, uh, they start feeling, oh, okay. So it's not a very long paragraph, although it is a long comprehension. This, I think I do it invariably. So one of my students told me, okay, Ms. Shilpa, you don't have to say that every time. I know why you're saying this, <laughs> but it's okay. We still try and we make them feel good because, you know, some comprehensions in our local school MOE exams are so long. They can be really, really challenging. The sheer length of that passage scares the child who has uh, learning difficulty or dyslexia because the child can already see what all is you know it's like oncoming now okay i have to read i have to understand i have to write the answers that's a quite a bit of task for them so at least you know when we practice in our session we i always start with okay thank god there are only three paragraphs only four okay let's number them and if there are more than five i will i always mention okay good these are all small short paragraphs thank god one, two, three, four. Let them be eight or nine, doesn't matter. So here we go, numbering the paragraphs. Highlight the keywords in each paragraph and understand the meaning, direct as well as contextual. Okay, before this, sorry, I, I went to strategy straight away, but what we do actually, the most important thing what we do is, uh, I get the child, we, we all do actually rather, uh, we get them to read the whole passage quietly in their head. So no sound, room is very quiet. We don't move because they total, they need to focus what they're reading on. After that, I get them to read aloud. Second reading is reading aloud because that's the time we hear which are the words they are making mistakes on while reading, you know? So there are gaps. Now, uh, even though they have dyslexia, we can't be spending every session uh, um, on uh, doing only dyslexia-based work or phonics work because we have to go in tandem with their curriculum, right? What they're doing in school. So it, what we do is we fill in the gaps. So if I notice some spelling or some word is being misread, or like there is a pattern, you can sense it, you can see it. So we mark it and we work on it. We reinforce it, uh, reinforce that spelling rule 
at the end of the lesson, not while the child is reading the paragraph passage. We don't, I don't want to cut the student off. It's okay, as long as they understand. And then I read it to them. I read it aloud to them. The reason is I have seen when I read, some of the kids have come back and said, oh, I didn't know how to read this word. Do you read it differently? And then I say, yes, this is where we mark it. And this is how it is read. So it's okay. Like we as teachers, we can always make that effort. And not only that, I read with expression uh, so that, you know, they know how they should, where they should pause, how, what kind of expression they should bring in. So it all becomes more of an interactive activity. So that's when, after that, we go numbering the paragraphs, highlighting the keywords, knowing the meanings of the word, uh, literal or contextual, because sometimes the words can mean totally different, uh, although they look straightforward. Then we go and identify main theme as much as possible. Here we speak about prior knowledge. The lesson has to be interactive because I have seen and that when, when you give them that opportunity to speak, what they know about it, it's amazing. Some of the results, like it's, it's so amazing. Sometimes they have so much knowledge that I learn from them. I've noticed that they know so much and they tell me, oh, but I, I've read this somewhere. I've seen it in some documentary. It was like this. And it's so good to hear, you know. And then when you tell them honestly, oh, I didn't know that. That self-esteem is here already. It's very important. And you know what? It's I feel interactive uh, lesson is important, especially uh, to prior knowledge because they feel good about themselves. They feel that they are given the authority to speak about something which they know. And uh, that's extremely important, according to me, at least. So prior knowledge and then prediction, of course, what do you think will happen? This is a game which we all play and they love it, most of them. Especially if there is a story, if there is a mystery story or anything, like they, they like to predict. And uh, visualization, of course, and summarizing each paragraph. I will go to that slide. There is slide what we do, but basically, like I said, instead of completely focusing on the whole long passage, because it is anyway in broken into paragraphs, we focus on those paragraphs and understand what each, what, the gist of each paragraph, what is it trying to tell? And this way, even the teacher understands if the student is understanding what he's reading or not. And do I need to, Come in, uh, come in and help right now with that. And final is making inference. Of course, the most important, making inference. And uh, because that's when we are already going to move to questions and uh, start answering them. Can we go to next slide? Okay. This is where the schema refers to the information uh, we have stored in our brain. This information is made up of everything. Schema is nice, nice word. What it means is everything we know or we think we know. So it is like background knowledge, prior experiences, all that is basically schema plus information in the text equals to inference, another equation. So this is how the children will do schema, which is the prior knowledge plus the information in the text connection equals to the inform inference. We have to teach students how to activate the schema or prior knowledge and connect it with the text. How do we do it? First thing is reading books. Okay, if reading books, reading is, uh, it becomes a challenging activity. We all can use text to speech, uh, you know, which can make text the stress of them, you know, a fear of, oh my God, I have to read so much. No. So we can, you know, create that interest of reading short books. Uh, there are some uh, resources which I'll, I have given a slide about. Watching documentaries, not long ones, short documentaries, informative documentaries, which can create interest, easy to retain the information about it. Most important, interactive discussion. I already spoke about it. Why? Because they get the authority. They get a chance to speak. They get a chance to share. And that's, that's how their schema is activated. And they, then they can come to an inference. Next slide, please, Anna. Okay, this is just a sample of making and evaluating predictions. We won't, it's just a sample I have given here. It's like evidence is the detective is holding a magnifying glass. Prediction could be anything. He's just looking at the glass. Maybe his magnifying glass is broken. But no, the prediction comes straight away to our mind is this is a crime story. Then we need to give a new evidence that Holmes was investigating a case, a case with a hat and a goose. 
So final prediction evaluation is Holmes was trying to find the owner of the hat and goods. So this is how we teach children to go step by step. Sometimes they can jump to predictions, but then we teach them, go back to the text, look for the evidence and then connect it, come to this evaluative answer. Anna, next please. This is a story. Do we, uh, 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 Deb, do we have two minutes? Maybe our viewers can just take a look. Uh, we, we, have, we have five minutes left, Shilpa, but um, I'm sure everybody would love to hear from you. So keep going. Thank you. So just take a look at this uh, short. This is a very cute little short story. Uh, all my students, the younger ones, they really love this story because there is a lot of, according to them, there was mystery and there is uh, scope for prediction. Shall we? It's basically a little girl is, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> finding where the smell is coming from. And what I was saying just now that the contextual meaning, there is a first sentence in the first paragraph, you know, uh, is, uh, was there some accident? So my student asked, well, there is no accident. The, when I look at the picture, everything looks okay. So here there is an idiomatic meaning. If the dog has pooped, <laughs> that's what it is. So is that why the smell is there? So we have to teach them that no, every time it is not straightforward. You can use and you have to understand what the inference is. So summarizing, consolidating the key information from the text. We all know what we, how we do this, but we teach them so each paragraph. Who are the characters? What is the main theme of the paragraph? Not the whole passage. When and where it is happening. So the whole paragraph, we try to get them to summarize in one sentence, whatever the way they can. But they have, so it is so interesting that I find it difficult sometimes, like because we, so many words are coming to my mind when I want to summarize. But these kids, they really come up with very nice short sentence, what they want to say. That's a skill they start learning. And this skill will be very helpful to them as they, uh, if they are primary school children, this will be very helpful when they move to secondary school because they are expected to write summary. So by the time they reach their 10th grade or IGCSC, they all are going to need this skill. So if we start developing it, this is a kind of base. And this teaches them to look at the keywords, gist of the paragraph and put it in words, not just go all over the place. Inferencing, drawing a conclusion from clues and evidences. Just now when we saw that story, this is what happens. Read the text, look for the clues or important facts and details. Combine those details with your prior knowledge. Here comes schema again. This is how we activate it. And then make inferences. This looks repetitive, but this is what we are all the time doing with our students. That's why I said, we, I don't want to call comprehension as a task. I want to call it an activity, which is, uh, which is like, which happens in the classroom, you know, in, uh, and teacher is equally involved. You have to show that student that yes, Please share your knowledge and I'm going to share my knowledge as well. And if you have more, I'm going to praise you. I'm not going to tell you to jump to questions and answers right away because comprehension is all about understanding. So basically this is what it is, summarizing and inferencing our major uh, skills, which they will be using when they use their, uh, we can use as strategies uh, before hitting the questions. Can we go to next slide, Anna? I'm so sorry, I'm a little longer. Okay, this is just the example of summarizing in one sentence. So this is such a long sentence they gave. One of the most noticeable phenomena in any big city, such as London or Paris, is the steadily increasing number of petrol-driven vehicles, some in private ownership, others belonging to the public transport system, which congest the roads and render rapid movements more difficult year by year. Wow. And summary is just in one short sentence, big cities have, we have growing traffic problems. This is what exactly we get the, our children to do. We show them that paragraph and we say, what do you think? So sometimes they say also, why they have written so many words? I can just put it in one sentence and exactly that we want to achieve.
to make them understand that, yes, my dear, you can put it in short sentence or maybe a couple of sentence if not one sentence. So summarizing is one of the best techniques to develop language uh, skills, vocabulary skills and sentence structure. They are unknowingly doing that. You know, they are, the children don't even realize, we don't even have to say that, okay, make a sentence. They're already doing it. They're already using their skills and developing. So can we go to the next uh, slide, Anna? Okay, so what are the, the types of questions which are uh, phrased? Literal or direct, which the answers can be found in the passage directly, just like my student told me, refer to paragraph two, refer to paragraph three. They are not supposed to do that. They have to write the whole sentence, but they're easy to find these. Referent, need to find what or who the phrase or word or a pronoun is referring to. Usually they ask, you know, so it was, uh, to, uh, it, it happened in 1926. And then they'll ask, what does the word it refer to? So we have to teach the child, okay, look, go backward, don't go forward look at the previous sentence and that will give you the answer. So this is the referent, yeah. Inferential, the major, the most one. Reading between the lines, reading beyond the words, whatever we can say, not directly found in the text, but need to make connections to prior knowledge. They do learn it, definitely. Many of them, they start progressing in this area and we have spoken a lot about it already, yeah. Next one, vocabulary, of course finding equivalent words in the passage for given words. This activity, this game, I play without fail in every session of mine. At the end of the session, what I do is that I write the meanings on the whiteboard and then I ask them, okay, find the matching word in the passage. This is just like a, like a com competition, you know, because sometimes I will, they will say, okay, you find the word and I'll go and write the wrong word. Okay, that's a strategy. Every teacher has to do that sometimes. Sometimes I will go and write and they'll tell me, no, that's wrong. Because I already know that child has found the correct word. Then only I'll make that mistake. So this is all known things. And uh, the best part is they love it. If the child is young, you offer them a sticker or whatever. The older ones don't even want to look at the stickers. You say that and they say, no. Secondary school or high schooler, they say, no. And so, but you can praise them, of course. You can say, wow, your vocabulary is great. And this, uh, these words, we always add to their word bank. So their word bank starts becoming bigger and bigger. And uh, uh, just, just to, before I go ahead, I had an IB student who did online sessions with me. I did a lot of vocabulary with her because I noticed that she was lacking in that. And her word bank in those 20 sessions, it was like, she said so many words Ms. Shilpa have written. And I told her that please, on your own, you should study and keep using them in your writing, in your, you know, not only sentences, write the whole paragraphs with that. Okay, next question. Evaluative, the one which we just now tried. Uh, we saw the Sherlock Holmes uh, thing. Finding evidence in the text to support your answer. This skill is extremely important when they start writing essays. I mean, not only text, like sometimes when they have to link, when they're writing about something, they have to give evidence, you know, especially literature. So that's where this uh, skill will come very handy. I work with a lot of IB level students and uh, IGCSEs also, and of course the younger ones, but uh, I have noticed that this skill they need a lot. So if we start working on it, just like I said, from the beginning, by the time they reach their secondary three, secondary four, I'm sure they will have that confidence, even despite having dyslexia or whatever. The last, do we have any more? I know. What, no, that was the last one. Okay, these are just sample comprehension questions. I'm sure all our teachers who are <laughs> attending this, they all know. So simple, the fan blade went round and round. Mother had to stop little Anthony from touching it. This was what I was talking about. What does the word it refer to? Here it is quite easy, but in a longer passage, it can be challenging. So they really have to learn to look at the previous sentence. Number two is the beast chased Imran into the empty park. He ran for his life. Fortunately, he saw a pond. How would Imran escape from the bees? My student got stuck on this question. She said, what can he do now? He just has to run for his life. The pond is no use. <laughs> so then I said, no, he can jump into the pond. But if he doesn't know swimming, then how? Yes, correct. It's a very good question. 
So I, I had to stop and think, I said, yeah, that's a good uh, query, you know. So I said, yes, if Imran doesn't, he doesn't know how to swim, he might as well run for his life. But see, we can make it, we can change everything into the fun and we can get them involved. So, oh no, I have forgotten to bring my homework again. Mr. Theo will punish me this time. Don't we are all local school children, they all know this, they say it all the time. Is this the first time he forgot to bring, she forgot to bring her homework? Write the word or phrase that supports your answer. This is evaluative or evidence-based or inferential. So just single word again tells them that the, the child has to go back, read, underline, think. What tells them? For, for someone like me or someone who doesn't have language, uh, uh, you know, how to say, like difficulty or dyslexia, that person can straight away see and say, oh, okay, that word. But for a child, sometimes it can be an effort. So we have to teach them, read it again, uh, uh, emphasize that word, and then they understand. Next slide, please, Anna. We are almost at the end now. These are some just uh, uh, as assistive technology, which we do use, uh, text-to-speech regularly for children. If they want, uh, if we want them to use a short storybook or something, you know, uh, we. It, it's a difficult task in, in a session of one and a half hours. If I say, okay, let's start reading a book. That, that's going to take away the enthusiasm completely. So what we I do is, uh, there is, I have given the name of the resource. I always thank Anabarta for that, that we have this Raz Plus. It is so wonderful. They have such lovely stories and very informative. I, in fact, the, the other day I read one story about uh, a Syrian family which made my student aware about what happened, you know? And so because text to speech, they have OCR also, every word is highlighted. Uh, so what, the child doesn't have to make an effort. Sometimes they are sick, sometimes they have sore throat, sometimes they don't want to read aloud because they are tired at the end of the day. This is just wonderful because it retains the interest of the child in reading, in that comprehension, because there are a lot of questions based on that. There are grammar-based questions punctuation, everything. They're ready to do that. So text-to-speech, OCR, and graphic organizers, we all use whichever way. You can make your own. You can use, I think it's on Google as well. We can use that. And using accessibility functions to customize the font size and color, it can be used to change the font size, color, to make it more interesting and easier if there is some vision issue. Uh, so, you know, these are a few. I mean, there are multiple, many, many, uh, assistive technology tools, but these are the ones which we have been using sometimes. So that's what I thought I should mention. Next slide, Anna. Okay, here are some resources to help comprehension skills. Google drawings for graphic organizer, just now I mentioned, you can do your own graphic organizer, handmade or Google drawings. Raz Plus, I love this resource <laughs> for text at various levels with built-in text-to-speech function. It's just fantastic. And there are questions. What I like about them is it's they have comprehension questions, they have grammar questions, they have phonological awareness worksheets. Wonderful. You can get that student through a lot of activities, you know. Edupress reading comprehension practice cards to identify. I use these regularly. They're small cards. There is a short paragraph. The child has to read. I have seen children uh, improving in their reading fluency very well with this because it goes like a flashcard. It's a stack of cards and I, you just give them, you give it repetitively every alternate session or whatever. And then you have, they have to identify main idea. Clicker seven, you, uh, you all can check for young learners. Stair game, we have it in our center also. One of the, another wonderful resources, picture cards. It helps working memory. It improves the retention and it works as a comprehension. This is also the, so number two, three and five, I'm using regularly with my students and I'm seeing the big, big difference, definitely. And of course there are multiple uh, resources. We have uh, in the Dyslexia Association, we have multiple, like it's like for a teacher like me, it's like, oh my God, which one should I, should I use? You know, it's always when I open the cupboard or when I look at them, it's so wonderful to look at those resources. And I think that is the reason our kids, they come out with, you know, because we use all that. So it's hands-on and uh, it helps, yeah. So the last one, I think I think we are done. Anna, what's the next slide? Oh, okay. This is just for fun. 
I mean, they, they all can look at it and they can just think later when they have time. I just wanted to add in this because I always find it fun to, you know, find the, uh, find the answers to this. We will be sharing it later, right? On YouTube, Anna. So I can, they can take a look. Shall we go to the last one? Okay. So these are the courses. Like uh, we just had this, like spoke about a few things, but we have proper courses, DAS academies conducting certificate courses and uh, workshops. You can go online. Yeah, you can go on this links and check that out. Wonderful courses, really. Like you want to put the workshop links into the chat. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Can oh, I? Hi. I was just about, I was about to say we'll put the links into the mm. chat. Yeah, and Shilpa, you've run over time, but um, everyone's Sorry, still with you, us. As so. usual. <laughs> thank you so much for letting me, Deborah. Thank and, you. Um, it's been and, really good. Uh, everyone, everyone, yeah, everyone stayed with us. It's been wonderful. Thank Excellent. you very much, Shilpa. Yeah, thank you. we thank haven't you had any. We me. haven't had any. We haven't had any questions. Feedback form. Uh, but uh, yeah, the feedback form is there. We'd love to have your feedback. Um, if you would provide that for us, it helps us to helps us to improve in the future. Um, Shilpa is here. Um, her email is here. If you'd like to email her directly. Um, and uh, we can uh, we can share these slides um, with you. Uh, we'll upload them on the international DAS International website. And those who have registered, um, I can also send you through the feedback form and the slides. Someone wants to see the resource slide again, so let me just quickly share the. Oh yeah, please. Oh, yeah, slide sure. again. Let me find it now. The last, I think last but Yeah, it's the last one, right? The last, the second. Um, no, this one. That. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's the one. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, this one, right? Yes, that's the one. Want to take a screenshot to ask the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for joining us for your lunch today. Um, mm -hmm. It was very, very interesting, Shilpa. Yeah, so um, good. And, I really, and, I really, I'm like, wow, it's just flowing and you shared so much of your practical. I think what I, I've got from this session that came through for me was um, you infuse your practical experience, you know, from of teaching your kids and what you've along the way have learned. And so you're, you're just sharing all these uh, nice nuggets with us. That, yeah. That's right, right? We keep learning from them. It's like that yeah. <laughs> crossover learning all the time, yes. Yeah, so I think we must wrap up the session right there. Please. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah, we, okay. we, we, we invited Rebecca to join us from DAS Academy because uh, Rebecca's yeah. strength is in teaching, practice, and, and also in comprehension. Um, yeah. But... Mm. But your session was very engaging, Chilpa. So um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking we need to do another one. I'm <laughs> sure, good. I'm sure, we should, I'm sure we could cook up a, another session mm. on uh, comprehension, <laughs> yes, yeah, especially for older, for older students, you know, for high school mm, yeah. students. It's a very different yeah. thing altogether. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. I remember at school, I used to hate doing reading comprehension. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, put the link to the okay. feedback session to the feedback form, Deborah. So that yes, in it's in I I put it in I've put it into the chat. Um, okay, great. So uh I can so, do it again. Yeah, I think it's there. So it sorry. Yeah, here it is again. Mm. Um hang on, I'll I'll share I'll share my um I'll share my QR code if that helps people to okay. uh, quickly so whilst yeah, you're yeah. doing that um, and everyone's scanning and you can do two things at one time and listen to me <laughs> closing yes. so that uh, make use of the time. So thank you everyone uh, really for attending our talk today and being such a great audience and everyone stayed, mostly everyone like there was 114 of you. Very good. Thank you so That's much. So wonderful. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, really so so pleased. And we hope you enjoyed our webinar series today. And if you'd like to catch up, um, Deborah will just put them up on the YouTube. 
And just a few words. Once again, I'd like to really sincerely thank you, Shilpa, for being a part of our specialist tutoring team. Thank you for giving us this opportunity, Anna. Yeah, I really benefited from you, you know, and I'm sure people have taken away a lot of takeaways and strategies. Um, so we support the students with uh, specific learning differences uh, on a one-on-one -on -one to DAS International. And so um, we have a uh, spotlight series coming up next. The next one is also, I think the topic will be of interest. And it's the current topic right now, like comprehension, is uh, the importance of executive functioning skills in a child with SPLD. And this will be on the 16th of November. Deb will, will, will dish out more information. Yep, I can Thank do you. that. You yeah. Stay tuned, stay Stay, Stay on our mailing list and you'll hear yes. about everything. Connect yes. with us yes. on Facebook. So we always share something in there. So if you want to know what, what's coming up for DAS International. And mm. uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining and us. Everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good day, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.